Welcome everyone. My name is Robin Lanzi. I am a professor here at UAB CIFAR with the Implementation Science Consultation Hub. Excited to welcome you uh, to the Community Engagement HIV Research Community Insights, Experiences, uh, and Best Practices. Um, I just wanted to first give you a brief overview of today's agenda. Our goal is to um, first do a, a welcome. Uh, Chris Simon from Yale and I will do a brief um, welcome. And after that, we'll have our panelists' introductions, brief insights on community engagement HIV research, and then we'll shift to a moderated discussion um, centering around really some uh, key nuggets of advice uh, around academic and community partnerships. Then we'll uh, go into some breakout groups and there'll be two different case scenarios that will be um, facilitated. We'll have note takers um, around community academic research partnerships and, um, and engage in thoughts on um, how to handle and navigate this experience. Then we'll come back um, and uh, sharing back on these sort of key themes that were discussed. Um, I'm sure that will take us to our, um, to our hour. So um, with that, um, I would just, <clears throat> on behalf of the UAB CIFAR Implementation Science Consultation Hub, um, welcome you and thank you on behalf of also Michael Magovero, MPI, and many of our um, investigators and consultants here for our team. Really thrilled and thankful to have you here, as well as um, see some NIH colleagues as well. And uh, we'll turn it over to our Yale colleagues. Chris? Good morning, everyone. As Robin said, my name is Chris Simon, and I'm an associate research scientist at Yale School of Public Health and also serve as a qualitative consultant for the Yale's Ready Hub. Um, I'm going to be providing a quick overview of our, our hub um, at Yale. It's called the Ready, which stands for Rigorous, Rapid, Relevant, Evidence, Ad Adaptation, and implement Implementation to Ending the HIV epidemic implement, implementation science. Uh, the Ready Hub leverages the expertise of Yale School of Public Health Center for Methods in Implementation and Prevention Science and SARA Yale Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS to provide technical assistance to ending the health HIV epidemic projects from all over the country. Uh, the Ready Hub does this in collaboration with ISCI Implementation Science Coordination, Consultation, and Collaboration Initiative, and the other Implementation Science Technical Assistance Hubs, like at the UAB Hub, which creates opportunities to translate local knowledge into generalizable knowledge whenever possible. I'm really happy to be here with all of you, and I'm excited for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, love um, partnering with you on this uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, have some good um, in-depth discussion around community engagement. Um, uh, so we will now move into hearing from our esteemed panelists and they will introduce themselves, share a little bit about themselves and um, and then kind of what they bring to the table around community engaged um, research. And so um, with that, uh, I think we'll start with Chris. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Cole. I'm executive director at APNH, a place to nourish your health in New Haven, Connecticut, formerly AIDS Project New Haven. I'm also a community advisory board member and executive committee member on CIRA, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS at Yale. Um, I have uh, participated in several uh, research projects with uh, faculty at Yale, as well as uh, other organizations throughout the state. Um, we've had some great experiences. We've had some not so great experiences. Um, I've had the opportunity uh, to work on several projects with one particular uh, faculty member at Yale who um, was a part of the Robert Wood Johnson Scholar uh, Program here. Um, and she and I now do a class each uh, spring on community-based participatory research, which is focused on a lot of what 
we are talking about today. Um, so my, my, what I bring to the table is really the experience of, of from the community perspective uh, and from multiple years of working on several projects. Good morning, I'm Eras Williams with Williams and Associates in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we are a community-based public health agency addressing minority health disparities. Uh, I have been involved in HIV and AIDS uh, direct services uh, research for about 20 plus years, uh, working primarily in the African American community. And uh, we provide, uh, like I said, direct services under Ryan, the Ryan White program. Uh, some CDC prevention programs and um, have kept, tried to hit the, hit the gamut in terms of uh, meeting the needs of the community. I would say that what we bring to the table, not only myself as an individual, but our agency is knowledge of the community, uh, which is very important in terms of research. Uh, does, as I'll talk about later, research is a four letter word in many of our communities. So, uh, you know, being able to give credibility uh, to not only to ourselves, but to our partners as well is important. So I'm looking forward to the discussion this morning. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Mardricus Harris, the Director of Community Investments with the Southern AIDS Coalition. Um, I use he, him pronouns. And some of my experience that I bring to the table is um, Community level research in partnership with some of the grant making that we do um, with uh, Duke University's their Center for Health Policy and Inequalities Research as an individual. My entry into HIV work was through Emory University School of Medicine on the uh, HIV, HIV Vaccine Trials Network 505 research study that was happening in uh, like 2010, 2011. Um, I'm currently a community strategies group member for HPT and HIV Prevention Trials Network. Um, 096 that group and so we also have funding here at our organization to where we do work with COVID and COVID vaccine prevention network and HVT and again HVT and trials network and uh, what makes SAC unique, I think, in this conversation is, hello, Dr. Nelson, I see him putting the chat, HVT and 096, um, is that SAC, while we are community-based, sometimes not in the traditional way. Hey, who, did I call the wrong guardian answer? Because I thought. Oh, okay. So what makes us unique is that we are community-based, but not in all the traditional way of being a community-based organization. And we aren't at academia, but we partner with academia. So what we do is we bridge the gap between the two to bring that um, intentional dialogue, intentional conversation to really make sure that the communication mechanisms that happen between the both are understood by both parties. So I think that's what makes us unique. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have um, Karen. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Karen Musgrove. Um, I'm the CEO for Birmingham AIDS Outreach. And uh, Birmingham AIDS Outreach is, or BAO, is a community-based organization. Um, we are a Ryan White um, grantee for our HIV services. And then we also have a concentration in LGBTQ health, mental health, and research. So we have, um, in addition to HIV, um, our HIV world and our testing and COVID and vaccine world, we have um, the Magic City Acceptance Center, which is an LGBTQ youth center, the Wellness Center, which is a medical and mental health um, provider facility, and now the Magic City Acceptance Academy, which we believe is the first and only LGBTQ affirming charter school. So we bring to the table um, how to do unique um, HIV and LGBTQ programs in the deep south, which is not always easy. And then also to what it's like to be a true community-based organization um, with a hundred plus employees, which kind of is an interesting um, place to be that we've maintained this community connection as we continue to grow and learn. Um, we do research and um, Dr. Emma Kay is gonna explain our research that we do. And then we also in and of ourselves are researchers in the organization. So happy to be here. Thank you, Emma. Hey everybody, 
I'm Emma Kay, so I'm also at BAO, as is Dr. Musgrove, um, but I'm the director of our research institute. It's called the Magic City Research Institute. So we are, it, I think we may be one of the few nonprofit um, research institutes located within a nonprofit organization as well. So BAO is all about being unique um, and, and doing things, you know, that really nobody else is doing. Um, but so at the Institute or MCRI, we do a lot of the things that you would do in an academic institution. You know, we write grants, we write papers, we collect and analyze data, but we do it with a community-centered focus. So every grant, every project that we're a part of is um, very much driven by community need. Uh, we make sure that community members are part of the process, not just, you know, in an ad hoc kind of way, but in a really meaningful way. Um, and so just to give you an example of the types of things we do, uh, we have everything from, um, you know, pilot grants, um, some are from UAB, um, we have some funding from um, the um, Alabama uh, Department of, of Public Health, you know, not so much research, but demonstration projects. We have several grants from the CDC, both um, demonstration projects and research. We have a research grant from SAMHSA. We also have, um, at this point, I think we have three R01s. So, but again, it, it doesn't matter how big the grant is or how small, it is always aimed at the community. All of our research is around either HIV health or LGBTQ health more broadly. Um, and every single grant is focused on addressing the very real health disparities that we see here in Alabama, as well as throughout the Deep South. Um, and so, you know, I started, you know, this conversation telling you about how unique I think the AO and the MCRI is. So what we bring is that unique perspective of being both uh, a researcher and a community member. So housing research within a community organization is I think I think one of the best ways to really make sure that your research is community engaged. Thank you. Thank you all um, for that and sharing um, a little bit about you. It's really um, just feel honored to be in your presence and for you all to be um, sharing your insights with us. And Emma, you gave us a great segue really to, so what is um, community engaged research? And um, yeah, so how would you, um, if you were asked to share, as I'm asking you now, <laughs> to share what community engaged research is, um, and then we'll kind of shift into a discussion around it. Yeah, so community engaged research is, really a continuum, right? So you can have engagement um, at uh, a smaller level where community members, you know, provide ideas or you have, you know, a round table or something, then the researchers take it from there. That's not so much my, my favorite model because it's less community and more research. But on the other side of the spectrum is research that's actually led or co-led by community members. So not just asking the community, what are your needs? What are your problems? Let, you know, we're, we're the researchers, we're gonna go fix it. It's actually, you know, community members can participate in research too. Um, it's, it's not rocket science, right? Like everybody can, can, can do research and it's, it doesn't matter what your background is, we can all contribute to the process. And I think um, the onus is really on um, traditional researchers to make sure that they do include community in the process. So for me, true community engaged, engaged research or community-based participatory research, which is more led by the community, is the model. Um, well, it's good, what we're going to be talking about today, but I also think it's the way that research should be going because all of the problems, all, all of the problems that we see in the community can, can be best addressed with using the community, the community's expertise and, and um, you know, per, engaging with the community in an equitable manner. So you're not just taking from them, you're also um, giving back, so. Thank you. And I love that the in an equitable way. And mm -hmm. um, again, you're giving me great transitions here um, with my uh, prompt here. I will um, let's see if I can share my screen here, maybe. 
um, so that it can come up for everyone to see um, what we are going to be going around, but essentially asking um, our panel members to share your thoughts um, on uh, what would advice, what key nuggets of advice would you give um, to others um, around what researchers need to know, remember when working with the community to create those effective equitable community academic partnerships like Emma was just sharing. And so um, we'll sort of do a round robin here and maybe just kind of a few minutes, maybe start again with Chris, if that works. Sure, happy to. Um, I think, you know, the nuggets that I would give are, are make sure that it's a respectful, um, intentionally equitable and truly collaborative uh, process. I think fully engaging the community partners from the very beginning, from the design of the study or concept is really important. Um, we, we know the community. We've, you know, many of us who are, are working in uh, community-based organizations have been here for decades um, and working in our community for a very long time and, and know our community. Many are part of the community that we serve um, and really you know, respect that from the very beginning. Um, I think it's really important to respect the time and, and, and adequately compensate the organization, the participants and the clients uh, or patients of the organization um, in a, in a way that is truly equitable. That's not just a, you know, $10 gift card. I think, you know, making sure that there is plenty of time often, you know, we'll have folks who reach out and they need something yesterday and that doesn't necessarily work for, you know, us or for our participants. And we, you know, and we often want to say yes. Um, the, uh, Understanding, you know, our community-based organization, unlike the organization in Alabama, is not a research organization. We don't have that expertise. So offering learning to the uh, participants in the community-based organization is really important. Um, and, and that's been an invaluable part of participating in good community-based research projects with academics uh, for, for me personally and for us. Um, and, uh, and, and really invest in the relationship. You know, we're putting our um, reputation with our clients on the line. And I loved uh, what Arise said about um, research is a four letter word. Many of, of our community members do look at it that way. Uh, and if we're brokering that relationship, uh, we want to make sure that it's a respectful relationship and that it's in line with our culture and our values. Um, and we work hard with the academic partners that we work with to make sure that happens. So those would be uh, my key nuggets of advice. Thank you. Um, really appreciate that. And um, e -Rise, I think we're going to get a lot of uh, out of that four letter word and maybe shifting it from being the the sort of four letter hate maybe to the four letter love. I'm not sure, but if there's somewhere, I'm trying to think of a four letter word in between not coming to me yet, but it will, I think through this discussion, but um, yeah. So e -Rise, what might you want to add on to that? Grow. I love that, David. Thank you. Love it. Yes. I love a good um, opportunity to grow for sure. Um, if you could, uh, I think you need to eat. Um, Thank you. Never, never remember how to do that. Um, I think Chris uh, hit it on a spot too, in terms of a lot of the points, particularly around trust. Uh, uh, but I want to take it from the two Next perspectives, stop. and that's the perspective of the community-based organization and then the community itself. So I think from the agency perspective, when we talk about partnering around research, that transparency is important. Um, because our work around research in the past has been with some of the universities, local universities here. And unfortunately, because universities are structured the way they are, you know, when we talk about uh, costs and expense, 
uh, a lot. I know there are a lot of indirect costs that universities have to, uh, you know, some projects have to invest in. And so uh, being able to negotiate or work, you know, with the community-based organization so that uh, most of the resources actually not only support the project, but in what we say, kind of hit the streets, you know, in terms of doing real, you know, real uh, productive work. And so from that's from the agency perspective. And also um, as an agency, being able to be involved in a project from the very beginning, when you're, as a, as a university, when you're writing the grant, you know, bring me to the table. Um, don't bring me to the table after you got the grant and then say, we want you to do this piece and this piece and this piece, uh, or we need your help with this or that. Uh, but bring us in from the beginning. That's real collaboration. That's real partnership, I think. And from the community perspective, um, we kind of talked a little bit about this. Transparency is very, very important. Who, what, when, where, and how? And what's going to be the result? Uh, in the past, uh, and I can only speak about my own experience just here in St. Louis, you know, there have been research projects that have happened in our community, uh, but we never hear about the results or we don't get any, you know, there's you know, a couple of academic folks get published and, you know, uh, they're happy and they, and they just go away, but we never get the results from the work that, you know, that actually happened. So transparency and really uh, getting, you know, sharing, disseminating, the results and not just at a conference, you know, come back to our community, have a community town hall, share, share what happened actually. And uh, that could, because that is not only um, transparent, but it's also empowering to the community because then they have information, they have data that they can talk about next steps, you know, uh, in terms of supporting their communities. Relationship building, uh, Chris mentioned this too. You know, uh, just really having the relationship, not only uh, with us as agencies who are working in the community, but with the community themselves, you know, community members themselves, you know, getting, giving them key roles to play in the relation, you know, in the uh, research. Um, yeah, those, those, those are very important things, I think. So I'll just stop right there so you can share. Thank you. Uh, lots of good. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not. No, I, I, I was seeing um, Mark, please um, unmute. So I just wanted to if, defer to you if you. Oh, okay. yeah, no, I didn't if you were going to. So, yeah, for that question, for me, um, advice to give researchers, uh, always keeping at the top of mind that research should always be meaningfully rooted in the community that is intended to serve and that the priority population should be included from the onset of that. You know, creating a framework of partnership. Partnerships gives ownership to participants. They feel like they are a part of what is happening, what is going on. And treating community members when you bring them into the partnership as subject matter experts, because they are. They should not feel like second class citizens. They should not feel like they are in, individuals who are just here to get me to some numbers, here to get me to some results. Uh, and remember that no one knows a person's life better than the person who lives their life. No one knows a community perspective better than the people that make up the community. I think researchers, some additional advice is to be sure not to perpetuate stigmas. Stigmas are ever present, they're everywhere. Um, so be sure that you aren't perpetuating stigmas as it pertains to whatever the subject is that you're going into the community for. For me, the majority of my work lies with HIV and we know that with HIV, there are many stigmas, there are many things that show up that can be stigmatized. Um, and affirming and valuing when there is hesitation, when there is reservation, and keeping in mind that certain communities that you go into, there's a thing that we call medical mistrust that still lingers and it's lingered for some centuries. So you have to be understanding and you have to know that hesitation and reservation does not mean we don't want this unique experience, this unique form of research that could potentially better our community, but 
there is there are reasons that sometimes we are hesitant because as um a reason mentioned earlier sometimes people fly in and fly out we don't know what you did with our data we don't know what you're doing with our data and so understand also understanding the community that you are going into understanding the community that you are serving is not just enough sometimes to say, oh, I took a, class, a course in cultural competency, so now I know how to serve community X. Researchers, uh, a nugget is like practicing cultural humility, which is a practice of being vulnerable, being able to understand that communities change, they are not monoliths. So while there may be a broad picture of a community, individuals make up that community. So understanding that things show up differently. Um, so those would be my initial uh, onset, uh, my initial key nuggets that I would give to some of those researchers to um, also make sure you're not doing to communities what has historically been done to them valuing them when they have hesitation and reservations, not perpetuating stigmas and meaningfully involving them as subject matter experts and not people that just have a little opinion. That also plays into the equitable pay, equitable pay or equitable whatever you're offering them for participation. So those would be my uh, quick versions. Quick, but really um, important and just spot on. And so thank you for that. Um, Karen? Yeah, I'll go next. Um, so thank you to everybody else who's gone before because I agree with everything that was said. Um, so one thing I will talk about is, um, is time. And then sometimes from a smaller community-based organization perspective, just remember that um, we don't have these large university infrastructures. So our uh, finance person is probably also our HR person and our contract person and our faux attorney as well. So when um, we're trying to deal with these big contracts or hiring new employees, there is, it does take a little bit longer. We just don't have, um, all you know and people working and and fixing things really quickly and i think well i know that sometimes um the bigger universities or people you're trying to collaborate with sometimes gets frustrated with the smaller organizations so kind of just kind of remember that in the back of your head that we are um stretched to our limit um and our foundation isn't um an admin world it's in direct service world and so that does lend itself we don't move as quickly as we should um and then the other one too is that um, I was going to give an example of a really um, like really understanding um, the correct language of the research. So um, Emma and I just finished reviewing um, some questions, and um, this one of the questions was like the female gets um, the female of pregnancy or childbearing age, and so little things like that have huge implications that we put into the world. So that's that question is assuming that just females are of childbearing age, um, like the gender female. So make sure that you understand the population that you're trying to enter in and what would be triggering questions for them and um, ask for help and, and say, can you help review these questions before I you know, bring it to the public and stuff? I think that's really important. Most people would not understand why that would be a triggering question, um, but for our population, that would shut the survey down or the questionnaire down immediately and be a really big issue for our population. And then also um, things like the Tuskegee syphilis um, experiments, that is still with us. And so really understanding um, how history and research still has implications in our community to this day. We still have to overcome and, um, and really teach and educate individuals um, what is research and what are we asking of you and what do you get in return and why is this important because we still have those underlying um, you know parts of history that was just were so horrible so never underestimate um, the power of what has happened in the past and how it's being brought into your research. So I think understanding it and, and um, acknowledging it and how are we going to work through it or educate, um, that really helps move the process along. So those are that's what I would say to that um, question, so. I love that. And yeah. I, I love the time at all of the sort of different uh, ways it can be you know, yeah. individually, um, the community, the system-wide, just in general, the time and how all of that interfaces across. 
Yeah. In addition to everything you said, but yeah, yeah. sometimes <laughs> just like one contract change, which yeah. sounds so simple, can jam up our world for a couple of weeks. Um, and it's just because, like I said, we're stretched to the max just with trying to serve our clients and stuff like that just gets pushed to the side. So a little pa compassion for the community based organization. So um, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, Dr. K. Yeah, so, you know, I've gone last and I'm going last. And so everyone has shared such amazing um, nuggets of information that I don't know that I can really introduce any new ideas. I think that you all have really covered it. But what I will do is um, tell you how at MCRI, one way that we have um, developed a protocol to ensure that the, the community is engaged from day one. Um, so that's going to be my nugget of, of information. Um, so we, about a year ago, we implemented, it's, it's very simple. It's called like our concept proposal form. And anyone who's interested in researching with us, um, we just have a little link. It's a Google form. You fill it out. It takes five to 10 minutes. And you provide us with things like um, IRB approval, a uh, copy of your research plan, if you have any surveys or whatever, um, you send all of that to us so that we can review it. And first of all, make sure that it's going to be okay for our patients or clients, um, that it aligns with our values here. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to step in and make any changes if needed. And I will say that, you know, universities typically ask for a lot more in order to collaborate, right? You have to fill out a ton of forms. You have to go through an IRB, it's very time consuming. The things that we ask for aren't, aren't big and they aren't time consuming, but they just ensure, they really protect our clients more than anything else, but they also protect us in our time. Um, and we typically approve concepts. Typically people who come to us are very thoughtful um, and we're so happy to work with them. There are a couple where it's clear that they really don't have, um, the client's best interest at heart. And um, I'm personally okay with saying that, you know, we, thank you for your interest, but, um, you know, sorry. <laughs> and we've seen this a lot in particular with people who want to work um, with the children at the academy. And they are, you know, such a vulnerable population. They've already been through so much. Um, and we, we, we protect them in that way. So, all of that to say that it's just small little protocols like this that help really protect community organizations and that also train, um, you know, university researchers to approach us in the way that we would approach them uh, if we wanted to work with them. So I think that all goes back to, um, you know, equitability and um, treating each other with respect, um, not only as fellow researchers, community versus academic investigators, but also the clients. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the um, very specific example that you're sharing. And really, we can all, you know, uh, take that and um, and uh, incorporate in what we do. And sometimes it's that not simple idea, but very concrete. This is what we could do. What? How about you try it out? And if we all just kind of operated with sort of that same level of um, understanding how much better um, these partnerships would be. Um, so uh, a little sidebar conversation that was going on in, in uh, the panelists, what we'll do is since there is such amazing conversation going here, um, let's just keep it together, not break out and do breakout groups given we've got 22 minutes and um, as uh, Debbie was saying, this is not a shy group and I love it. I'm here for it. And um, let's all be as one here and share our thoughts. What I'll do is pull up the breakout groups um, scenarios and maybe what we could do is invite our panel members to start the conversation going and uh, we welcome maybe um, any other additional conversation around the um the scenarios and how you might suggest moving forward 
Um, and we'll just see how this goes. This is just real time fun, I think, together and um, learning from each other. So let me pull up, if I can, the um, slide here that shows the um, what were to be the breakout groups. So this is what we were going to have, two different scenarios. So what I'll do is um, maybe, Lakin, if you could put into the chat um, scenario one, so everybody can have that scenario, and then we'll um, take the, the um, PowerPoint down so we can see each other. Um, and I'll read it and then um, just really open it up for a conversation around this first scenario. So scenario one, and we'll go with this and discuss this and then kind of hopefully have some great discussion around that and then talk about scenario two and then loop back. Okay. So scenario one is you are the executive director of a small community-based organization serving sexual and gender minority people living with HIV in rural Mississippi. You were recently contacted by a researcher from a local university for a potential partnership opportunity to test the effectiveness of a new intervention. You are hesitant because your previous experience with this university was not entirely positive. On a previous study, the researcher seemed too busy to fully engage in the study. And, oh, I don't think I have it all on here. And um, um, too busy to fully engage in the study and constantly missing meetings and really return your calls um, or emails. And then after this, essentially, um, everyone was not so happy and, um, and they're reaching back out. So what do you do? So now we will just open it up and, oh good, so it's in the chat. So, um, all right, so rarely returning your emails or calls after the study concluded, many of the people involved expressed frustration because the programs and services related to study also ended. So talking about sustainability as well as an issue here um, and really thoughts on that, how to handle that. Um, Anyone want to go first? I'm happy to call on anyone. Oh, good. We got audience participation. Let's go, John. Yeah, I, I most likely would probably reach out and see if there was anybody else in that organization that was sort of working on the same type of in intervention and see if they would be like to pop in and kind of like find out from those those researchers maybe their supervisor to see what what the problem is with them that they can't make these calls and stuff like that maybe there's a conflict of meeting times call times you know as researchers as you as yourselves know you might say three o'clock and then a client walks in at five minutes to three with an emergency mm -hmm. bingo you miss out on a call because you got to deal with this emergency first got it I hear you approaching this from a very um, compassionate centered approach. Um, yeah, um, I think I saw Paul's hand go up next and certainly want to invite our panel members too as well. Um, Hi everyone. So I'm Paul and I'm uh, the chair of the Providence Boston uh, CFAR CSERC, which is the Community Engaged Research Council. And I also am a consultant for other CFARs and other community groups around um, community engagement. Um, but I, I think for me, again, I would take the um, compassionate view I, because I think part of the process of community engagement is also us educating the people who are doing the research and the institutions that are, because it's been my experience that so much of what we talked about today, which are all amazing and important points, they really don't understand or know. It's like researchers and community members speak two different languages and then never and two never meet, right? So I guess I would just have a conversation with them and talk about the issues that were raised in the case about not showing up at meetings, not getting back to people, whatever it was. And also just kind of do a sort of a little teaching seminar on sort of, you know, not preaching, but just say, you know, this is why this is important. This is why follow-up is important. So really to give them an opportunity to like answer the questions. Um, figure out what they're doing wrong, but in a, in a way that's helpful to them, because I think, you know, we all look at institutions for future research projects and, you know, we don't want to exclude people, but we also want to make sure that they're well educated in the process. And I, and I think that's a really important point because, um, you know, 
um, when we talk about research and, and community, we want to make sure that we start establishing partnerships and relationships um, and relationships that, that are bi-directional, obviously, and equitable. So I think that would be my approach first and um, not necessarily exclude them, but, you know, give them the tools and a toolkit to do better the next time, so to speak. I hear you. And um, lots of great, I think, one-liners here. Maybe just everybody's here for it, but the preaching, not teaching kind of thing um, is what I uh, really um, appreciate your points there on that. Yeah. It's actually teaching, not preaching. What did I say? Preaching? <laughs> preaching, not teaching. Well, you know. I don't want to get that mixed up. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Lawrence? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm a community engagement consultant for the New York State Department of Health for Older Adults. And one of the first things that I would consider is not to place blame on the previous uh, experience you had and to lay down the ground rules for this and to make an agreement that these certain things would be adhered to with no exception. And with that, then I would consider possibly going forward. And um, also as a consumer uh, of the uh, Consumers Committee for the New York City um, Planning Council, some of the members are on, I'm so proud of all of them, Michael just spoke, that really listen to the consumers. I made a comment in the chat, COVID-19 has uh, held, you know, has affected community involvement. Uh, a lot of cabs weren't meeting and so forth, but getting back to the original question, it would be, to lay down the ground rules to what the expectations are, what we want to uh, work in partnership to, you know, to have a, a favorite result. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see also some panel members raising their hands too. So maybe we can ping pong between panel members and participants. Uh, Karen? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that um, when we first started 10, 15 years ago, really engaged in research with universities. And we had a lot of these problems. We didn't know who to call. We didn't know who to complain to. There was just this very um, mystery around research. And we didn't even know that we had um, like the right to have an issue with the researchers. Does that make sense? We felt like it was a very um, hierarchy and we were not kind of on the same playing field um, being a community-based organization. But bringing in um, and creating the Magic City Research Institute with Dr. K and the form that she talked about, once that was established, we have kind of removed all of the unknowns. And it's created this, um, a better relationship. There's more communication. We know who is in charge. We know who's in charge of the person who's in charge. And so it really has stopped all these roadblocks and miscommunication and the fear of the unknown when it comes to research. So I would um, highly encourage people to kind of take this model because it's working and it's really simple. Emma talked about, it's, it's a simple form, but it really does kind of lay everything out with all the expectations so that we're all on the same page and people don't get their feelings hurt and you know where how it's going to start what the middle is and then what the end is and I think that ultimately is where everybody it gets a little messy um, sometimes when you don't know that kind of stuff so um, so it, so that's my suggestion because it really has changed the conversation for us looking at research from the other side of the research so yeah Clarity and communicating um, around sort of expectations, P, T. Um, so Chris, maybe, and then we'll go back to our participants. Yeah, I, I, I love the uh, written agreement. And, you know, I think as Dr. Musgrove said, um, we often feel like we don't have rights in that. And, and I've come to believe we do. And no is a complete sentence. So... While this scenario goes beyond the, I've had a bad experience in the past, but this is what happened. If I've had a bad experience in the past with a research, it's okay to say no and not take that on. And I know we talked about that in, uh, in the planning call last week that we had where some said, you know, we don't feel like we can say no, or, you know, I think we can. Thank you. 
Um, appreciate that. Uh, let's see, Ebony. Hi, how are you? My name is Ebony Jackson Shahid. I'm the director of health and social services for the city of Bridgeport. Um, so everyone pretty much said something that I was going to say, but there was just one thing that I wanted to add. Um, I think oftentimes when we come uh, in contact with someone who's doing research, we usually find that they don't have um, all the resources. So sometimes they have a really good idea. They want to go ahead and do a study, but then they don't have um, the research team. And then usually when they're not really getting back to us and things like that, we kind of figure out that they don't have a research team or they don't have proper resources. So what we tend to do is we'll, we will come up with some sort of agreement and then we'll either offer them some of our team members or you know a health research associate or an epidemiologist to kind of get them on track or we'll connect them with a community organization that wants to do that same work so that we can kind of have build a research team. Um, and that's usually the thing that we come in contact with is that people, you know, they'll, they'll have some funding um, and they'll have a researcher, maybe an assistant, but then they don't have those very important other research team members to kind of bring it together. So those constantly missing meetings and, and things like that, it's probably because they don't have enough team members for the research that they want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate. Um, yeah, time is coming up a lot for sure. And understanding and expectations and clarity. Um, appreciate that so much. Uh, Leo? Lots of great things have been said. But one thing that I feel that hasn't been said is inspect what you expect. So, you know, if, if there's like a research that's six weeks out, Maybe on the second week, you might want to check in and say, hey, how's it going? What do you have so far? You know, blah, blah. and then on the third or fourth week, you know, and not wait until the fifth, sixth week to discover, oh, no, they never got it. And all this time has been wasted. And now we have to do all this catch up. So, you know, I, I think in, inspect what you expect um, and, and just kind of like check, check along the way. How's it going? You know, uh, and, and take a pulse check. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me. All right. Uh, well, I'd invite any of our panel members who would like to um, share any th other thoughts on the scenario and our participants, and then we might move to scenario two. Yeah, this is Mark Jurgis. Um, just kind of like what Leo just said, what I wrote in my notes really quickly is uh, a contract, a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding of some sort, but also communicating upfront that we have the ability to revisit this contract, to revisit this agreement and active, proactive check-ins, right? set check-ins to where we are discussing where we are, what is the progress, what does this look like, do we have this, what are payments looking like, and are payments based on deliverables, or are our payments based on these things, because I think when you put some real uh, agreements to these things, like deliverables being met, are determined if this happens, or if that happens, it kind of changes the dynamic um, and so that is kind of like, and that's kind of like how we do our partnership that we have. We check in uh, sometimes bi-weekly. Um, they work directly with our partners, et cetera. And when things change, um, the ability to have a conversation that's not scripted, that's not set on a calendar, but having that flexibility, even with everybody's crazy schedules, because we know the work we do, everybody's schedules are crazy, but just, just being flexible and understanding that there is a bigger picture um, and there's a larger community that is depending on the success of what we are doing. And when we keep those priorities at the forefront, I think we can make everything work out. What a beautiful perspective you have and such a amazing heart you're leading with for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I see your hand up. Is Did you know? From... I think it was still up from before. Okay. Um, thank you. So um, we do have about six minutes remaining. So what I'll do is uh, share the scenario. Um, I'll read it and then uh, we'll follow up with an interesting point here. Um, okay, so scenario two is you are a researcher with a large urban university in Mississippi. 
You've been working with a rural community-based organization to research the effects of a new intervention to increase PrEP uptake. The project has been challenging as your community partner often does not understand the requirements of the research project and instead uh, complains about the challenges of navigating PrEP systems. Your team has analyzed the data from the study but hasn't had an opportunity to share it with your community partner. You're feeling the pressure to submit an abstract on your study to an upcoming prestigious conference. With the deadline quickly approaching, you decide to submit the abstract without talking to your community partners or listing them as authors. Thoughts? Feedback? The scenario is also in the chat. I would just say that this is a big mistake. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, just like I said earlier, don't bring me to the table, you know, uh, after you've written the grant or you've gotten the project idea, uh, bring me to the table at the beginning and, and make sure that I'm involved in all, all those parts. And when I say me, not just me as an individual, but the community, the community itself, bring the community to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Emma? I didn't have my hand raised, although I can talk. Yeah, no, me to? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. I saw that John has. Oh, okay, good. Sorry, my screens are going around. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. I was uh, like, I'll just... there was, I'm sorry, am I stepping? No, you go ahead because your hand was raised. It's... No, I was just saying, I would agree with every, every, there was the, you know, if, you, if you're going to do all this work without my input, then why make my worth feel worthless? You know, uh, why bring me to that table? If you're gonna do all the work yourself, just, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. It was even kind of hard to read the scenario, I have to say. Um, I almost didn't wanna finish the scenario just because it is certainly that path you do not wanna go down of um, sort of how it ended with the scenario. Um, no, I, I, I thought it was a very good scenario because again, you know yourselves, you guys do a lot of webinars and you always see the same faces. You have a hundred people uh, sign up, but it's always the same faces you see. You know, and it's the same thing, like when you do these type of things, it's, you have all these people that want to be involved, but it's always the same faces. Yes, and I think that um, my point is more wanting to have that open communication, collaboration, um, clarity, uh, from the beginning and so that there are those channels so that hopefully this it would not get to that place in the end to where you know you are under that pressure to submit and it's just moving forward with not a sort of an understanding of what happens in this instance um, one you don't get to that instance but two if you do how you proceed um, and I think um, that there clearly from the conversation, lots of opportunities to kind of have those touch points along the way and engage in um, more of a, um, you know, good uh, collaborative conversation around this. So um, hand raise noted <laughs> in, in real time. Um, I just want to say that I, I understand this scenario from both sides, given my position, but I will say that if you really have, regardless of a particular grant and its deadline, if you really have been putting in the work with the community in this particular area that you're interested in researching, if you've done that up to that point, I think communities are more willing to quote unquote forgive you like, well, you've proven yourself to be a really thoughtful collaborator thus far. Sorry you have this grant deadline maybe we'll work with you this time. So not to say that I think that this is the best way to do it, but that, you know, this is just one point in time, right? And if you do put in the work, you do show that you're thinking of the community um, and have their best interests at heart, then again, sometimes we'll make exceptions. So, yeah. Thanks, Emma. Again, mm -hmm. I'm hearing lots of compassion and care and leading with, um, a heart of um, of that and um, lots of uh, so much good um, conversation around sort of how do you go between that one kind of four letter word to the other kind of four letter word and 
grow in the middle. Um, and I love that um, uh, uh, piece to that and how we can grow together where we, regardless of where we are on the spectrum of developing our academic and community partnerships and recognizing that regardless if we haven't established one, that they're always growing and that we can all grow together. Um, in that. So um, we have our one minute warning and we'll invite, um, oh, I see David, maybe one last point from David with his hand raised and then we'll have a final thought from our panelist and then unfortunately be at the end of the hour. David? Thanks so much, Robin. Um, I'm David Martin, a consumer at large at the New York HIV Planning Council. And I would just think that for the last scenario, that planning is important no matter what the grant deadline is. And if you, you're, you're, you're putting your research at risk if you don't take the time to plan appropriately. And if there's a grant deadline coming up, then you should ask for an extension on that deadline if possible. But I think sometimes we forget about the um, commitment to the subjects in the research and what you're asking for them and what how the timing it takes to get this information. If you're not communicating with one another, that's a big red flag. And so I would say, don't push through, make sure that the quality and structure and integrity of your research is there. And so to jump out, I mean, there's a process, agile process of iterations, looking at things as they move along. If you can't fit that mold, then stop, reassess and ask for more time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Really um, good um, and important sort of insights on both sides again. And I think, of, and throughout it. So um, I just will have a final thought opportunity for our panelists to kind of bring it home. Anyone who would like to share as we, um, are at the top of the hour, end of the hour, however you want to approach it. So I'll go, okay, you rise. Yes, no. please. I would just probably end by saying that when we talk about community engagement, uh, it's really a plus when we do that from the perspective of community building, because that itself, you know, uh, involves building relationships. Uh, it speaks to stability and sustainability and um, longevity in terms of the relationship between the university and the community or whatever research the researcher in the community. Thank you. Any other panel members? This is Margaret. I'll just say always remember uh, the collaboration, partnership, meaningful involvement, and the, the, that the community, they really are subject matter experts. And if we live out those things, if we prioritize those things, I think it creates a, it is the start of a beautiful relationship versus, versus a relationship that has the aspects of being users to meet a goal. Absolutely. Chris, anything? I have nothing that I would add to what's just been said. Thank you. And Karen and Emma? Um, well, I would just say thank you to the researchers for, um, for looking at community-based organizations as equals and in, in, in this you know, as we move forward with research and, and integrating our uh, our uh, our clients, the people that we serve. I mean, my organization has changed completely when we really looked at research as a component of the organization and created the Research Institute. Um, we're not the same agency we were five years ago, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, and that's a good thing. And I love that we're part of the conversation um, and that we're coming together as a collaborative partnership and involving the community and the people um, that we serve. So I think it's amazing and I wanna keep doing it. So thank you to, uh, to everybody and uh, in this conversation. So. Thank you. I agree with what Karen said. Um, I think it, the fact that we're even having this conversation is a really good sign. And I think, I think 
that, I don't know, maybe 2023 is the year that we really do community-based participatory research. I think, I think the interest is there and the time is right. So I'm feeling very hopeful. Thanks for having us. And thank you all for being you. And thank you for being here and uh, really thankful to NIH um, for funding the EHE um, Implementation Science Consultation Hubs for us to be able to um, uh, present these um, seminars and collaborative work with Yale here at UAB. And so very thankful for this partnership. And um, we will be posting this recording um, on our um, websites. And so just Google UAB CIFAR um, and I'm sure the Yale as well and the Ready Hub. And so we'll have those up uh, shortly. And um, I don't know, the researcher in me says there's a publication coming out of this, just putting it out there um, and in a collaborative way, you know, um, but thank you. Thank you all. And I hope you all have a, a wonderful rest of your day and um, take care.